Hello and good afternoon, everyone. My name is Chanel Hasty. I'm the executive assistant to Jeff Finkel, the president and CEO here at IEDC. We want to welcome you all to today's webinar event, the Great Reset Number Three, Race and the Role of Economic Development to Foster Equity. This event is part of IEDC's new Take Action Against Racism and Economic Development webinar series, a four-part series developed in response to the race and justice movement currently enveloping the United States. IEDC is kicking off the Take Action series with today's webinar in partnership with ROI Research on Investment and Gazelle.ai. Before we get started, I would like to share a few housekeeping notes. The first is to please note that all attendees will be muted during the webinar. The second is that you will have an opportunity to submit text questions to today's presenters by typing them into the questions pane in your control panel. You may send in your questions at any time and we will address them during the Q&A session. The last is that within 48 hours, all slides will be available on IEDC's website. Now, I would, I would like to introduce you to, to your moderator, Stephen Jast, president and founder of ROI Research on hmm. Investment in Gazelle.ai. Please join me in welcoming Steve. Thanks very much, Chanel. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us. It's my pleasure to serve as your moderator for today's webinar. I'd like to take a few, uh, I'd like to take a quick moment to thank our panelists, as well as the ROI and Gazelle AI teams for their hard work leading up to today's event. I'd also like to say a special thanks to IDC and Jeff Finkel in particular for partnering with us on this important webinar series. Uh, as Chanel mentioned, this, well, this webinar will last around 60 minutes and feature three amazing panelists who will each speak for approximately 10 minutes. Following all the presentations, we'll have a roundtable discussion followed by a Q&A period. Whoops. Okay. Oh, there's a delay. So was I, okay, here we go. So connecting the dots between COVID the Black Lives Matter movement and the George Floyd tragedy that led to widespread social unrest is the need to advance social equity. While the social justice goal is by far the most important in the discussion surrounding equity, we're going to spend some time today on the economic perspective as well. As advancing racial equity requires the work of many stakeholders, we hope that this webinar will be meaningful and actionable for leaders, economic development professionals, influencers and in businesses, communities and institutions, as each of us has an active role to play in the process. My hope is that today's webinar will advance dialogue to effectively close gaps in opportunity and outcomes and achieve greater social justice and racial equity. First, a bit of context. US economic growth is slowing and is below the pace of emerging nations like China and India. Prior to COVID, many industries in the US were challenged by shortages of workers with the necessary training and experience, and the skills gap is projected to increase. We also witnessed declining labor force participation and the aging of the baby boomers, whose retirement represents both the loss of a generation of experienced workers and a growing strain on state and federal government budgets. By enabling the full creative and economic potential of all people, irrespective of color, we can increase the size and skills of our workforce, increase productivity, and boost long-term economic growth. Reducing occupational barriers for women and the black population in the latter half of the 20th century was a major contributor to US economic growth. We're way on the wrong slide here. Sorry about that. Okay. Furthering the success of populations of color will not only serve an important social justice goal, it will be a major driver of our collective social and economic well-being. However, there's work to do. Today, the average earnings of persons of color are 63% of the average of whites. Raising the average earnings of people of color to match those of whites would generate an additional $1 trillion in earnings 
representing a 15% gain. Because this gain would be generated through greater productivity, it would translate to an additional 2.7 trillion in GDP. By 2050, given the expected growth in populations of color, closing the earnings gap would increase inflation-adjusted earnings by 22%. The corresponding gain in 2050 GDP would be $8 trillion, an amount greater than the current GDP of every country in the world, except the US and China. Closing the gap means lessening and ultimately eliminating disparities and opportunity differentials that limit the contributions of people of color. Advancing racial equity can translate into meaningful increases in consumer spending, as well as federal, state, and local tax revenues, not to mention the most important of all, which is an improved standard of living for everyone for generations to come. From an entrepreneurial perspective, Black-owned businesses have long faced challenges in getting financing. In 2018, only 31% of Black-owned businesses received all the funding they applied for, compared with 49% of white-owned businesses. Moreover, 38% of Black-owned small businesses did not receive any of the financing they applied for, compared with 20% of white-owned businesses. And only 1% of Black business owners obtained loans in their founding year, compared to 7% of white business owners. Difficulties in securing financing show up in business ownership. Black people represent 12.7% of the US population, but only 4.3% of the nation's 22.2 million business owners. Among black owned businesses, 21% were financially distressed at the end of 2019 based on their profitability, credit score, and earnings compared to just 5% of white owned businesses. Long standing wealth disparities leave black entrepreneurs with fewer funds to fall back on and at higher risk of bankruptcy, particularly during times of economic crisis as brought on by COVID. The challenges faced by black owned businesses are not new but they have been intensified by the COVID crisis. Government programs such as the Paycheck Protection Program, the PPP, haven't always been helpful. Only 12% of Black and Latino-owned businesses that sought assistance from the federal government received the amount they requested, and 41% were denied. Estimates suggest that as many as 95% of Black-owned businesses had virtually no chance of receiving a loan through the PPP, due to the eligibility criteria. Before the COVID crisis, economists feared a recession would significantly hurt black entrepreneurs. A report published by the National Bureau of Economic Research found that the number of African-American business owners fell from 1.1 million in February 2020 to 640,000 in April, representing a drop of 41% compared to a drop of 17% in white-owned businesses. For Black-owned businesses, insufficient support, combined with the recession's disproportionate impact on Black consumers, has made the economic consequences of the pandemic doubly painful. Whoops. Seems to jump from time to time. Okay. In April, national Black unemployment sat at 16.7% versus white unemployment, which hit 14.2%. By May, the disparity grew further. Black unemployment grew to 16.8% versus the 12.4% white unemployment rate. So how do we address these clear disparities? How and where should investments be made to most effectively close gaps in opportunity and achieve greater racial equity? Programs and policies in the key domains of housing, education, health, criminal justice, employment, and entrepreneurship separately and in combination provide a path forward. Today, we'll focus primarily on employment and entrepreneurship. Let's take a quick moment to meet our panelists. Mr. Henry Coxum. As president of Coxum Enterprises, amongst other business ventures, Henry is the owner operator of three McDonald's restaurants in New Orleans. New Orleans, N New Orleans. Is that right, uh, Henry? No, New Orleans? Yeah, yeah. yeah, is that close enough for this Canadian kid? Okay. Uh, his first job with the McDonald's Corporation was as a manager trainee at the McDonald's restaurant located in Eastern Netherlands in 1984. His career came full circle in 2002 when he became the owner-operator of that very same restaurant. 
I must confess that I've introduced my share of panelists over the years doing webinars, but few have been awarded quite as many accolades as you, Henry. So editing your bio was a real challenge. So I prepared a small sample, a little sort of tapas of, of some of your awards and accolades. So please forgive me if I've left some out that you prefer that should have been kept in. But we could have done a whole webinar just on, on your resume. So Henry is the founding and emeritus chairman of the New Orleans Business Alliance. He's president of the Great Southern Region's Black McDonald's Operator Association. He's the recipient of the Ronald Award, a prestigious award which honors McDonald's owner operators for outstanding service. He's a member of the board of the New Orleans Museum of Art, the Audubon Nature Institute, the National World War II Museum, and the New Orleans African American Museum. He's a recipient of the United Way's Alexi de Tocqueville Award, which is the highest honor bestowed by the United Way. He's the recipient of the McDonald's 365 Black Award, recognizing outstanding individuals who are committed to making positive contributions that strengthen the African American community. And least but not last but not least, he is the recipient of the 2017 Chairman's Award for Lifetime Achievement from our very own IEDC. Henry will discuss the progression of his career working at McDonald's Corporation to an eventual multiple franchise owner. Henry's career is an example of how large corporations can play a significant role in fostering equity through their mentoring, education, stability, and scholarship programs. Henry will also share his experience as a business owner, both pre and post COVID, as well as the need for a strong federal response and a coordinated effort amongst all levels of government to help with our recovery. Adam Knapp, equally, uh, equally established. Adam was named president and CEO of the Baton Rouge Area Chamber in April 2008. Adam previously served as the deputy director of the Louisiana Recovery Authority. Prior to his LRA tenure, Adam served as economic development advisor to two governors and the policy director for Louisiana Economic Development. Prior to state government, Adam worked for Accenture as an emerging technology consultant. Adam graduated from Davidson College in 1996 and studied at Harvard University's John F. Kennedy School of Government and Julius Maximilian's Universität in Würzburg, Germany. Adam will share data related to Black-owned businesses and economic inclusion in the Baton Rouge metro area, as well as the challenges these businesses faced before and as a result of the COVID crisis. Adam will discuss the gap in the delivery of capital through the PPP to white versus Black-owned businesses the need for more data, as well as programs that BRAC has established to help minority businesses to compete and scale. Okay, and last, but certainly not least, my good old friend, Rod Miller, who I very fondly remember visiting with me here in Montreal about 20 years ago. Rod was named the Chief Executive Officer at Invest Puerto Rico in 2019. Rod joined Invest Puerto Rico after leading Ascendant Global, an economic development firm focused on providing growth solutions to help economies sustain themselves and gain jobs in private investment. Prior to that, Rod was president and CEO of the Detroit Economic Growth Corporation, the public-private partnership charged with leading the economic revitalization of the city of Detroit. Rod also serves as the founding president and CEO of the New Orleans Business Alliance. He holds a master of public policy from Harvard University's Kennedy School of Government and a Bachelor of Science in International Business from St. Augustine's College. He is also a Fulbright Fellow and fluent in Spanish, I might add, which somehow, Rod, you didn't put on your resume here. Threw, threw that in for you. People may be wondering how you got that gig in Puerto Rico without speaking Spanish. Rod will discuss the role of government and economic development organizations to create and advocate for policies to further generate race-based equity in business Rod will also provide some historical context regarding the role of government in policy formulation. Finally, Rod will explore potential opportunities for Black-owned businesses as a result of the COVID crisis. So without any further ado, please join me in welcoming Mr. Henry Coxum as our first speaker. Mr. Coxum, the floor is yours. Good morning. Good afternoon now. Before joining McDonald's, Another career as an urban planner in Chicago, the city's Chicago Committee on Urban Opportunity. After writing various programmatic grants for the Dusabu Museum of African American History, I wrote a grant for the Chicago Community Trust for a two-year grant to fund 
the development office for the DuSable Museum. When that grant was funded, I was approached by its founder, Dr. Margaret Taylor Goss Burroughs, who was born in St. Rose, Louisiana, to accept that position. The opportunity was most challenging because it involved me taking a $10,000 pay and cut, a pay rate, a pay cut, $10,000 back in 1977. That was an enormous sum of money. However, I accepted the position. This woman had the tenacity of more tenacity than anyone I've ever met. She was a humanist, an artist, and she later became my mentor, and it changed my life forever. That position was the best position I ever had, although it did not pay well. The benefits were extraordinary. I got to start an art collection. I had a chance to work with many notables in the area of African American history. I learned how to do prospecting for fund development. I actually got certified as a uh, fundraising executive. It was a something that I'll remember for the rest of my life. Nevertheless, after two years, I had an opportunity to go back to urban planning and went back as the executive director of the South Town Planning Association. The significance of that was that it was in the Halstead community of Chicago. Little did I know later on that I would get to meet the first African-American operator, Herman Petty, and to see his restaurant and where he started. Moving full circle, Dr. Burroughs later made me aware of an opportunity that the Ford Foundation had for a development director in New Orleans. That, uh, that organization was the Amistad Research Center. Upon an interview in New York, I secured that position. In May of 1982, I relocated to New Orleans. Another two-year funding opportunity, another funding opportunity under financed. So for three opportunities, I had a salary of $25,000 and a fundraising budget. It was a far cry from government, but the positions were ones of responsibility, and it gave me a chance to really circulate throughout the African-American community. At the same time, it gave me a chance to be mentored by others. In Chicago, I had a chance to study at the Field Museum of History, the Chicago Arts Museum, and the Detroit Museum of Art. In New Orleans, John Bullard of the New Orleans Museum of Art mentored me. I had a chance to sit at the best tables and learn how to collect the check. The most beautiful thing about Dr. Burroughs with her being a humanist, I learned the importance of leaving a legacy and making a difference in one's community. She was the first African American graduate of the Chicago Arts Institute. She was also the founder of the Southside Community Arts Center and the Hyde Park Arts Festival. Her perspective for me, her dream, was that although I was great at writing proposals for grants and now prospecting for checks, is that one day I would be able to write that check myself, which ignited an ambition that was totally dormant. I began my McDonald's career 35 years ago, but it was actually two years earlier after reading In Search of Excellence that I was inspired to make the transition from nonprofit and governmental administration 
to one of the country's leading corporations that embrace diversity, inclusion, and collaboration. I always wanted to be a part of a company that instills in its employee, employees the awareness that their best efforts are essential and that they can and will share in the rewards of the company's success. In In Search of Excellence, McDonald's is mentioned as one of the top 10 companies with clearly defined programs for minority career development and advancement with incentivized performance. Yes, I joined McDonald's in September of 1984 in New Orleans. Possibly an oxymoron because McDonald's was headquarters in the suburbs of Chicago in Oak Brook, Illinois. But I fell in love with New Orleans and I did not want to leave. The seafood, the culture, the festivals were invigorating. So I took this opportunity. At the time, the person and persons in my life thought I was having a nervous breakdown. Why would you go from where you are to saying, good morning, welcome to McDonald's, may I take your order? I had a vision. I had a vision of one day operating, being responsible for multiple units. And McDonald's was the greatest opportunity that I was aware of at that time. My younger brother, Harry, started with McDonald's in 1975, right out of college. And with an economics degree, I questioned his, uh, I questioned his sanity because I thought he could do more. But before I left Chicago, he came there in 1980 as a professor at Hamburger University, and he had over 200,000 shares of stock options. Being on the public side, I didn't understand what stock options were. I had a rude awakening coming and had to learn the value of them. And in looking back, I got a glimpse of McDonald's that was very invigorating. Although I did not want to flip burgers, for the first time in my life, I saw a company that had created a fully operating restaurant within the conference center of the Hyatt Regency on Wacker Drive. It was a fully functioning McDonald's, and I was blown away. Nevertheless, I was doing what I wanted to do. And I listened to him then. I would have been retired 15 years ago. Nevertheless, I joined McDonald's. My second day on the job, I was given the opportunity to experience the opening of an operator's 16th McDonald's restaurant in Baton Rouge. That production was like viewing a commercial. It was hugely impressive and reinforced why I was making this career transition at the young age of 32. Later that week, I was registered for Black Career Development, which was created to provide a roadmap for personal, organizational, and leadership development for African-American employees to navigate the restaurant process and the McDonald's system. I immediately created my own individual development plan and did a professional assessment that would identify the skill sets necessary to complete management training, then become a second assistant, first assistant, and restaurant manager. I had a plan to do all of that within the first year because I was hungry and aggressive. My restaurant name or nickname at that time was Inspe Inspector Gadget. It's a clipboard with station observation checklists, stopwatch thermometer, and a pocket quality reference guide were a part of my daily wardrobe. I was obsessed with learning everything about operations, all the times and temperatures and equipment calibrations, safety protocols, and maintenance guides. In reflection, that journey took over three years, 
due to the fact there were only 16 company-owned restaurants. They're called the Copco's in the New Orleans market. The prevailing joke was to become a GM, someone had to get fired, die, or get promoted to Oak Brook, Illinois to leverage that opportunity. I later requested an opportunity after attending a manager's convention to pursue a market trainer position in the South Florida region, where I had not lived since high school. I received two offers that same week for a GM position. Of course, I turned both opportunities down. With the New Orleans Regional Manager's blessing, I relocated as a market trainer to South Florida and the Caribbean region in June of 1987. This was an incredible opportunity to train new manager trainees and provide them with the skill sets to run shifts in a region with over 75 Macapcos. I had found my niche, and it was people development. My investment in the basics of the business and maturity was beginning to pay dividends. I love to teach for understanding, coach for results, and mentor my trainees in the restaurant environment. Our greatest challenge at that time was managing a changing workforce and turnover. In January of 1988, I became the general manager of Boca Fifth Avenue. The restaurant had been recently rebuilt in one of the highest income areas of Palm Beach County. It had an extreme staffing problem with lots of sales potential. Our short-term solution was to charter employees in from Miami for the initial seven weeks of operations. We developed a multicultural staffing plan that was dynamic, diverse, and aggressive. We were able to cultivate a local part-time staff of transplants, high school seniors, and retirees. We ultimately became a regional training restaurant and a people magnet for the area and grew crew and to crew trainers and then shift managers. We were competitive in sales, quality, service, and cleanliness, which we refer to as QSC, and profitability because of our focus on accountability, recognition, rewards, and people development. All the items or aspects of Tom Peters in search of excellence, which really focus on the dynamics of people. If you, if you acknowledge them, train them, and recognize and reward them, they will prosper and they will give you 110%. In October 1989, I became an area supervisor with seven restaurants in three counties. I spent my life on the Florida Turnpike system. That opportunity provided me with a non-traditional cultural experience to lead a diverse group of GMs. We continue to excel at sales by focusing on drive-through operations and speed of service. Our profitability came from focusing on food, costs, cash controls, and breakfast. We continued to make shift management development a priority and became the cornerstone which became the cornerstone of our success. It has been said that knowledge is power, but only when you can execute as well. Area supervision, performance rewards included opportunities to celebrate with your GMs at athletic and concert events at Joe Robbie Stadium and the Miami Arena. While there, in South Florida, I experienced my greatest appreciation for the McDonald's system. My greatest appreciation for who we were and what we did was when Hurricane Andrew struck South Florida in August of 1992. Our McFamily, corporate staff, owner operators, and suppliers were amazing. The leadership, compassion, and sense of purpose shown to first ensure that all of us were safe 
that our homes and then restaurants were secure, and ultimately our managers and crew and the communities that we serve. I will never forget that. Uh, we actually opened our restaurants because we did not have power. We donated the food to churches. We bought grills and helped them to cook it. For our managers and crew, we actually wrote checks. The rest of the system raised over $3 million and gave it to us to give back to our people. Many of those individuals, McDonald's became not only a care provider, but became their employer for life. Um, the turnover in South Florida uh, is still very limited, under 100%, even after 18 years, because everyone's life that we touch remembers what we did for them. And I, too, remember Hurricane Andrew. In December 1992, I relocated back to New Orleans region as a business consultant. I was ecstatic to return. Uh, with enhanced financial skill sets and accolades for demonstrated success, I was able to provide organizational support to seven owner-operator organizations with 21 restaurants in the New Orleans co-op. In September of 1994, I was promoted to regional quality management consultant and leveraged total quality management instruction for corporate staff and operators. I was certified to provide facilitated workshops on Stephen Covey's Seven Habits, First Things First, and Principal Centered Leadership. McDonald's had come into the total quality management framework. Historically, McDonald's was a company that hired from within. You came in as a crew and worked your way up through management. And back when I joined, I was atypical in 1984. Most of the folks in corporate staff had not only been uh, a crew or a manager, and half of them had met their spouses or a significant other at McDonald's. In January of 1996, I was promoted to senior training consultant and continued to provide classroom and field training to managers and corporate staff. In November of 1996, I was given my most challenging opportunity. I was promoted to an operations department head and to a regional field service manager. The region at that time had grown to provide uh, coverage to parts of 10 states. The New Orleans region stretched from Destin, Florida, to Hope, Arkansas. And I was fortunate enough to cover two-thirds of the state of Louisiana, half of Arkansas with restaurants in East Texas and Oklahoma. I was then responsible for 17 owner-operator organizations with 122 restaurants. I had a team of seven business consultants to assist me, and we were accountable for $320 million in sales that we grew to $350 million in sales over the next five years. McDonald's is three companies. It's a restaurant company that manufactures food. It's a real estate company that owns its sites. Then it's a marketing company. McDonald's spends more on marketing than its nearest competitor, competitor has in sales. <clears throat> That opportunity for me was incredible because the McDonald's system of training and development is incredible. When we plan, we make projections. There are commodities that we look at. So I know what percent of sales I'm projecting to come from beef, from chicken, from beverages, from breakfast, and from commodity savings. So when we focus on a plan, it's, in, it's incredibly dynamic. When we look at 
our financial means, there's never been a McDonald's operator, franchisee, that has defaulted on a loan. We have a group of five national bankers that provide support to us at below market rates. They compete for our business. So when you look at it, at being an entrepreneur, there are folks that come in from the system, and there are others that come out come in from all walks of life. We have McDonald's operators that are, trace, that are chasing the American dream. That are physicians, attorneys, real estate investors, and previously educators. So. To be a McDonald's franchisee has been a rewarding aspect of many individuals' dream. In May of 2002, I purchased my first three restaurants in New Orleans and became an operator. And I need to admit, clearly, I wanted to pursue my corporate career because I thought that I still had the potential to become an officer of McDonald's Corporation. However, I met this woman in New Orleans, and I tried to convince her to go to Chicago with me. She's a third-generation native, and she looked at me and said, you're never home anyway, so why don't you get a condo in downtown Chicago and go pursue your dream?" I thought about it for the weekend, maybe for another two weeks, and I said, nah, uh -uh. I'm staying here. And the rest is history. Karen and I married in uh, 2000, and she became a partner in the business. She now serves as my uh, director of communications and marketing. Uh, what's special is, about her is not that she's only, she's very physically attractive, but I married her for her brains. Okay, I don't tell great jokes. Nevertheless, I rebuilt the, uh, my original restaurant that I started my career in, I and Reed, in 1984. I rebuilt it in, uh, September of 2002, and I brought it online back in January of 2003. In 2003, we grew the business to be the number one owner-operator organization with comparative sales of 41.1% and guest counts of 28.9%. My officer in charge of the U.S. system said to me, if this all it took, I had grown a beard, I stopped wearing ties because I was no longer corporate. And she said, why didn't you tell me? If you had just let me know you wanted to grow a beard, I would let you have done it earlier. But the reality of it is, the McDonald's system is so integrated that I was doing what I was trained to do. I did now for myself what I did for McDonald's Corporation, and they were very rewarding. When you're on the corporate side, we work for officer, officer discretionary bonuses. When you get them, it may be ten, twenty, thirty thousand dollars, $30,000, and the taxes are paid. We work for stock options, and you let those mature, and that will finance your retirement. In my case, I leveraged some stock options, and that's how I purchased my initial restaurants. But when I think about it, life has a way of holding you accountable. I was doing too well. I was loving what I did and enjoying it immensely. Then I met this woman called Katrina. I met her August the 29th, 2005. 
she provides me an opportunity to rebuild my life. She was Hurricane Katrina, and we lost everything to her, as did my community. She affected not only South Florida, but most of Louisiana and continued to wreak havoc until she reached New York. We lost three restaurants, our training center, and a waterfront home full of memories. Nevertheless, I could not retire. My wife wanted me to continue to work. So on February the 6th, 2006, we reopened the first McDonald's on the east bank of New Orleans, St. Charles Avenue, in time for Mardi Gras. With 12 managers, 106 crew, at a sales pace of $4 million. I then proceeded to acquire and reopen three additional McDonald's restaurants in under eight months. In July 2007, we reopened our seventh restaurant at Bullet Road in Eastern New Orleans. There was a time when I thought that my daughter uh, would come into the business, but she met a chef that she met in kindergarten at Lusher. And they got married and decided that they wanted to open, a, open and operate a restaurant of their own. So they created the Munch Factory. The rest is history. They now have two locations, actually a third that's not thriving at the Louis Armstrong International Airport. That's another story. On January 16th, 2015, we sold four of the restaurants, which produced $10 million in sales, and we kept three restaurants that also produced $10 million in sales. Our goal is to drive our remaining three restaurants to $12 million in sales over the next seven years. We were on track to do that, and we felt very good about it. From its beginnings, over 60 years ago, McDonald's has been committed to do the right thing in accordance with its values and initiatives. As the world changes, so does McDonald's. It takes on the challenges that demand innovative solutions and collective action. It is especially known for its extensive training curriculum for its franchisees, corporate staff, and restaurant employees. Operating an ethical business that represents human rights is integral to any business. And as Ray Kroc, the founder of McDonald's, explained in 1958, the basis for our entire business is that we are ethical, truthful, and dependable. Fantastic. Thank you, Mr. Coxum. Um, I, I think we should probably move on to uh, our next speaker, but that was a fantastic, and we really appreciate you, you taking us through the progression of your career. Um, uh, so thanks very much. Uh, I would like to now bring on our next speaker, uh, Adam. Adam Knapp, the floor is now yours if you're ready to go. Thanks, Stephen. If uh, you can queue up the slides, I'll, I'll go through a couple of quick ones and, and share a little bit about what we've been through. And, and just want to say thank you to to, to Henry Coxon for sharing the, the story. Uh, and as, as he was getting to the experience in Katrina and now in another pandemic, um, we have seen in Louisiana feedback there is a, a significant impact. What we wanted to do as our organization, as a regional economic development organization, is to try to step back and, and in this moment where we find ourselves in, in, uh, in, a, in a pandemic crisis as a, as a nation, as a world, uh, as well as in this incredible moment uh, as a world and as a nation thinking about the issues of race equity in a very stark moment, uh, to see those two things together and to try to act with intentionality. Uh, as it happened, as we were coming into the pandemic, our organization was doing a five-year strategy and had uh, a consulting firm named Avalanche, uh, many folks may know, uh, doing research for us already to benchmark us against uh, a number of other metro areas you see here on the chart, 40 communities that are between a population of 400,000 and 2 million, 
Uh, Metro Baton Rouge is at about 800,000 uh, folks, a little over 800,000 folks. And so we wanted to see ourselves in relationship to other places. And while we looked at the things that you would normally look at in terms of economic performance, uh, workforce and educational attainment, talent migration issues and quality of place, we also uh, intentionally asked them to, to focus on diversity and inclusion data. And so the data we're sharing with you today uh, it takes a, three data points briefly to share with you about where we are as a metro area. And then I wanna kind of connect that back to what Steve was talking about in terms of the stark place that we find ourselves as a country. Uh, Baton Rouge is a place of uh, roughly about 35% uh, black families and households um, in, in that metro area of over 800,000 people. Uh, in East Baton Rouge Parish, the urban center, uh, our, our parish or our county, as we uh, think about it, that, that community is probably closer to 50% um, black households uh, within the urban, uh, dense urban community. And so we really wanted to understand how that shakes out uh, across the overall economy. So here's, here's three slides that I'll share with you that we found out about ourselves. One, um, we wanted to benchmark the, the amount of poverty by household uh, by ethnicity. And what you'll see here is a ratio, that number in the middle where Baton Rouge falls at 2.3, is the ratio between white non-Hispanic households, which find their household poverty rate at less than 10%, uh, and the, the, the ratio for non-white and Hispanic households at above 20%. And that's what that 2.3 represents is the, the difference of those two. And you'll see uh, if you want to try to have a, a community goal of having uh, as, as low as possible a gap between your, uh, your, your households of, of poverty, you, you got to try to move to the left end of this, this chart here. And, and that's what our challenge has been is to see strategies to do so. But we wanted to first start with the data. You'll see up in the top right corner, communities that are, we benchmark that are doing better on this category, and you'll see those flagged. Right here, we're, let's say we're roughly in the middle on this chart. What the next chart will show you is the income and in households in Baton Rouge uh, is as a significant gap. You heard Steve talk about this a moment ago. Uh, but in Baton Rouge, a white household uh, is earning $75,000 uh, as a median household income whereas a, a black household is earning $38,000 uh, as a median household income and Hispanic households in the middle at about 58,000. But that, that difference, uh, uh, that ratio of 2.4 puts us at the tied for the, the worst among the 40 communities we compared ourselves to. Again, you can see in the top right, some of the communities that perform better. Um, and this gives us probably our most stark outcome uh, of the three that I'll show you. And then we wanted to look at what is the role of a job at helping lift a, a family or uh, out of poverty? Uh, we wanted to know if, if folks who do get employed remain among the working poor uh, or if they lift themselves out, out of poverty. And the data shows that we're around in the middle again on this data point. We're around a little, little, uh, little under 7% of our households who a resident is em employed for six months or more. They are, uh, they're no longer in poverty uh, by and large. So, see how stark it is at the farthest end of the spectrum uh, where some communities have a rate of 16 percent uh, who are employed uh, but remain in poverty uh, but we are not where we would want to be uh, sort of closer to the the rate of four percent or, or lower as you can see at the, the best performing communities the question that that i think we're all asking ourselves and wanted to talk about and, and i think again stephen's opening slides did a nice job of sharing some data on this we took uh, eight different indicators i've shared just three here with you today uh, and we've tried to see on a metric comparing an index of our outcomes on uh, e economic inclusion data points and then comparing those to these 40, me 40 metros to see the metros uh, performance in terms of job creation over the last five years. Uh, and the final slide that I want to show you is, is just how significantly different um, those communities are that had better indicators for economic inclusion compared to Baton Rouge. If I can advance this slide. You may need the staff to advance it. It's no longer responding. Well, maybe uh, I'll, I'll, I'll narrate it. I go back one. So what we wanted to be able to show is that our metro, have we, have, the ability to improve our overall outcome on inclusion data 
Uh, it also has a direct connection to our performance and economic development. And this is the point I think that many of our communities are, are, are thinking about right now is what is the economic development connection for DNI work to job creation work? And if our core fundamental purpose is economic development, jobs in our regions, uh, quality of place in our regions, uh, what we can see is the outcomes on these data points that I shared a moment ago uh, have a direct connection if you can improve your outcomes uh, to the ability to see higher rates of overall uh, employment growth. Uh, in this moment in COVID-19, our organization has also been spending uh, quite a bit of time trying to make sure that we know we're focusing on some of the, the key challenges of, of uh, our community. And so we've, we've done a handful of things to try to address this during COVID-19. Uh, if you can advance one more slide. The, the, the first is trying to make sure we gather some data from black owned businesses in our community to make sure we're uh, driven following the data that we have in front of us to know what is the state of, uh, of our situation. We know uh, black households, black families have been more, uh, had more of a disparity of health outcomes uh, from COVID-19. We want to be able to measure if we also see a corresponding disparity of economic outcome. Uh, in a black owned business survey that we're going to be releasing shortly, we just concluded, uh, we found that 53% of black house or black businesses in Baton Rouge uh, applied for the Paycheck Protection Program surprised us to see so low a performance uh, in, in uh, overall uh, application rates uh, of those who finished the survey. While another 63%, they only have said they only have cash on hand for two weeks or less to survive as a business, while 4% said they have cash on hand to be able to survive longer than three months. So let it sink in about why access to financial programs matters so substantially right now. Uh, we did a pro, a, an initiative to make sure that Black businesses were encouraged to connect to new banking partners uh, for those who were not applying because of a lack of a financial relationship. Uh, we wanted to make sure that businesses knew they could establish a new banking relationship uh, when they applied, and we ended up doing a lot of matchmaking to banks in the communities. Uh, we made sure that we were doing that targeted outreach uh, in that period of time when the applications were, uh, were or it looked like they were going to run out of access uh, or the money was going to run out again. We continue to make sure we're pushing out access to other programs uh, and other relief programs are becoming available in Louisiana. Uh, we've also been uh, more intentional as an organization, try to help businesses that want to respond to diversity and inclusion initiatives inside of their businesses uh, to their own organizational requests. So in Baton Rouge, we have an organization called Dialogue on Race Louisiana. We've been uh, agreeing to pay half the cost for businesses who want to have their first Dialogue on Race session uh, internally for their staff to have a conversation about race. Uh, in the context of work or in the context of their lives, as well as helping companies to, to match up with others who can guide them through the practices of setting up uh, strong corporate internal, internal corporate diversity programs. And lastly, in terms of economic development work, we've tried to be more intentional in our own work to make sure that we're thinking about uh, business retention and expansion outreach uh, in our disinvested communities and to disadvantaged businesses. Uh, we've tried to make sure that the programs are available to all businesses uh, that are out offered by the state or by our community to help accelerate uh, business recovery as well as uh, business growth. And then finally, in our, in our work to make sure that our sites that we promote are available in all of our communities, and especially in our disadvantaged communities, we've been stepping up our efforts around site certification and site development, trying to make sure that our partners in communities, uh, especially communities of color or in disinvested communities, know how to go through the programs uh, that are available for site certification and site development. And then on our own, trying to do a better job of uh, offering up those sites that are match uh, or nearly match the offerings from site consultants uh, so that we can, can reach out and offer that those sites are available as well uh, in our community. And you can see largely those fit into one of these three circles uh, of initiatives that we think we were doing okay before COVID-19 and, and know uh, that we need to do continue to do a better job of being more intentional about these efforts guiding our work. Uh, for BRAC going forward. And with that, Steve, I'll, I'll pause and uh, uh, look forward to taking questions. Thank you for having me. That, uh, is it, does it mean, uh, should I move forward, Steve, or? I think you may be muted. Just waiting for the presentation to come up on the screen. Uh, okay. While the 
exploded. I'll, I'll share a couple of thoughts, you know, and this is this is great conversation, you know. Um, Steve kicked us off with some high level information around kind of some of the disparities that we had between the black and other communities of color and, and the majority population. And what we see is that these, these disparities are not new. So this isn't new, this is a timely moment to really kind of address and, 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 uh, and challenge and, and, and deal with these issues. But these are issues that have been longstanding. Um, and, I, and I would argue, you know, there is a social imperative uh, to, for, to, to actually uh, grow businesses of color, but there's equally as important an economic imperative. And what I would argue is that without focusing on that economic imperative, we really kind of miss, miss the mark in terms of what businesses of color and in particular black businesses can mean for the overall U.S. economy. Uh, and then, uh, and, uh, and I think we're at a critical moment. COVID has really provided us with some gravity around COVID in combination with kind of the social unrest and Black Lives Matter movement has provided us with some some gravity and some 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 focus that we've not really experienced as a country before, and I think it's uh, it's it's vitally important, and in particular for um, and in particular for uh, economic developers to play a key role in that. Um, uh, can we go to the next slide? And so as we as as we as we talk about what that means, um, I don't know if, if someone else has the control. It doesn't look like I have it. Um, yeah. So so what does that mean? Let's talk about this current environment. So the current environment is really an environment where the global economy, as well as the U.S., is going through a pretty significant transition. What is that transition? Well, what we're finding is that large and mature businesses are no longer the hegemons that they once were. They're having to compete with small upstart companies globally, um, and they're not able to pivot quite as quickly. Uh, and so they're not producing as many jobs as they once produced, and they can't really provide the foundation in the same way that they provided historically, although they're still an incredibly vital part of the economy. Uh, most new jobs are being created by small and medium-sized businesses. And you know, we know that over the next 25 years, people of color will be the majority uh, of the population in the United States and people of color as a bucket, and especially black people, lag behind the rest of the population in every, nearly every indicator of social and economic well-being. And so, uh, so this is an incredibly challenging time and these are not new issues. Um, um, that said, I think this creates a, a real opportunity. You know, this is the first time since the Great Depression that a white 30-year-old male is not expected to do better than his parents in the US. So we've got a time when everyone is actually struggling and where black communities and brown communities that have always been behind are falling further behind. Um, so the question now is, how do we create more jobs? Where can they come from and how can they get here? And I would argue that, uh, uh, that businesses of color, uh, black businesses really represent a huge opportunity to fill this gap and to ensure that the US economy doesn't fall um, uh, behind the global economy over the long term um, because of this latent um, capacity that's not being used. Next slide. Um, and so thinking about how, what that means, um, uh, if we could advance to the next slide, of, about what that means, you know, businesses of color are already behind. Uh, and, and, and so the gap in business creation among the people of color is costing the U.S. over uh, $300 billion in income annually and 9 million jobs. That's a problem. And what we know is that uh, non-whites, um, still on the last slide, non-whites, uh, uh, yeah, and what, what we know is that non-whites represent 38% of the U.S. population, but only 19% of entrepreneurs. Uh, and in urban areas that are majority people of color, that we're, uh, they're only 22% of entrepreneurs. So what that means is that the, the reality is that there is a mismatch in terms of the productivity of black and brown communities vis-a-vis -vis other, other communities for a variety of issues. And that's only been exacerbated by COVID-19. So um, we know that black businesses came at more than 40% in the last few years. Um, COVID-19 changes the game and, and really changes the game because we know that every time there is a major economic shakeup uh, or a, a market movement, there are a lot of people that lose a lot of money and there are also a lot of people that make a lot of money. And so I would argue that COVID-19 is a global economic reset that really should allow people who have not uh, been in the market to actually participate in the market. Um, social isolation is gonna cause people to rethink existing values. So, you know, we're all Zooming from home or our offices today. Uh, Long-term disruption in business operation are gonna cause 
many companies to rethink their capital expenditure models. So what we're going to see is a lot of real estate laying on the side of the market that might have otherwise been engaged by large companies. Um, trends suggest that investments in environmental tech, fintech, blockchain, et cetera, are going to continue to significantly grow. So those are some of the opportunities that are presented specifically because of COVID-19. And then when we think about that as it relates to um, uh, uh, businesses of color, next uh, next slide, the slide that said COVID-19 landscape, um, that global projections all point to a dramatic reduction in general economic opportunity. And, uh, uh, and so because we know that, you know, um, there's this dramatic reduction in economic opportunity, we have to be even more intentional about trying to figure out how do we actually help uh, businesses plug in and what are the opportunities that are going to be available today that might not have been available um, just a, just a six months ago? Uh, and, and those opportunities do exist. Uh, next slide. So economic developers, I would argue, have a an outsized role in, uh, in actually ensuring greater economic inclusion. Um, next slide, please. And economic inclusion. And, and what do I mean by that? Well, uh, many of the challenges that are upon us today are not just the result of slavery, but of, of a lot of other historic economic challenges, whether it's uh, redlining, uh, whether it's demolition of black business districts uh, for urban renewal, the list goes on and on. And so as economic developers, a local government has, has tools that they can leverage and in, to influence across an array of decision, uh, housing, economic development, procurement, so on. Um, they can leverage the bully pulpit to force conversations. And that's pretty powerful that um, economic developers and, and local government can pull in business leaders and say, this is important to us. We want you to focus on it. Uh, I would argue that building inclusive ecosystem across technical assistance, capital access, and real estate is one of the most important things we can do. Uh, uh, there has to be intentionality around building these, uh, building out these ecosystems and about focusing on problems. The things, you know, that Adam mentioned that really interesting is that they're not doing generic stuff. They're actually working on specific issues and challenges that these businesses have. And it's not a, uh, it's a market driven approach versus a patronage or social service approach to economic inclusion. Um, uh, uh, they have to be safety nets to, uh, to create, to encourage more entrepreneurship. And I would argue that, you know, uh, local economic development and local governments be, through their procurement function can play a very a strong role in growing businesses of color. Um, last slide. Um, I would say that, you know, by and large, there are a lot of resources that are out there and increasingly more. And, and a, a quick plug, I, I do have a book coming out through Living Cities in the next month that will be talking about what cities can do to grow uh, um, businesses owned by people of color. Um, but there are a lot of other resources out there, and I'm looking forward to uh, the conversation. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks so much, Rod. So I guess we have a, a few minutes left for, for some roundtable discussion. Uh, I've created a few topics for us all to, to talk about and share. So um, racial disparities in health status, access to healthcare, wealth, employment, wages, housing, income, and poverty all contributed to greater susceptibility to the COVID virus, both economically and physically. Are there any lessons, and maybe particularly Adam from the data you've collected, um, that we've learned following the initial wave that we can use moving forward? Uh, I know that, Rod, when we were talking before the webinar started, you were discussing some data that you had found that suggested that three to six times um, more blacks or, or three or, or blacks are three to six times more likely to pass uh, because of COVID um, as opposed to the white population. So what have we learned as far as distributing PPE? What have we learned as far as um, a, addressing an outbreak, particularly in, in communities of color? Well, I'll say something quickly and then let our others jump in. Uh, I think we've seen, and we're, we're in the middle, I think, of learning this still. Um, uh, I think we've seen a faster and a higher response rate uh, from businesses of color, uh, in Louisiana at least, to local, more local programs do better than federal programs. And yet we need federal resources in this time uh, to really drive, uh, drive access. So one thing we've noticed is there remains, at least for Louisiana, I can't speak for the country, obviously, but a, a, a concern about applying to federal programs uh, and that distrust perhaps of government uh, doesn't uh, exist as significantly the closer you get 
uh, to to the community. We've seen higher rates of application uh, from business of color for, from more localized programs as well as programs that are by design uh, inclusive of some portion of the program being a grant. The loan with the loan forgiveness uh, for whatever reason does create a lower application rate as we saw in, in our survey data, only about half of the businesses applying for PPP, even though it is promised to be a forgivable loan to the businesses. Uh, it's also the size of the loan, I didn't go into it, is a smaller size because of, I think, of that fear. Whereas we're in the middle of a grant program being offered by the state government using CARES Act dollars to get to businesses and the first businesses to apply uh, have to be those that are not currently getting a federal assistance through PPP or other things. Uh, and they reported to us this morning that they have 78% of their initial applicants in the first couple of weeks into that grant program, 78% are minority women owned or veteran owned businesses uh, of about 12,000 applicants to a grant program. So we see because of some intentionality, but, but also because it's a little closer to home uh, and it's a grant that there's a higher rate of access. The other big thing I think we saw in PPP that worked very well is to use the banks as the intermediary to get funding dollars out. Uh, right. That's working better than other programs, Steve. Right, right. Um, Rod, anything to add to that, Mr. Coxum? Well, you know, I think I think the point that that that's really really pointed there is is the reality that the the solutions you've got to have the federal help, but the federal help is not enough. But you definitely got to have that, and the best solutions are going to be a mix. It's going to take uh, the federal, state, and local all rowing in the same direction. And I think there's also a very important role for the private sector to play in that. So I think, you know, in terms of us as economic developers driving outcomes, we've got to be very intentional in pulling in the diverse resources that we can to kind of make sure businesses of color have access to, to capital and support. Okay. Let me read you a quick quote here from a, a study I have. Researchers found that the biggest difference between black and white job seekers was not educational performance, work ethic, or values, but rather access to contacts to help in the job search and entry process. So when we look around the US, we see different kinds of programs that, that I think are trying to address this. Uh, we see Ready Nation comes to mind, On Ramps comes to mind. On Ramps, for example, is a Washington DC based group that has been working on the issues of racism and socioeconomic barriers. Um, that African Americans face by helping students find STEM careers through paid um, technology skills based virtual internships. Uh, are, are these programs that are they having an effect, Rod? I mean, uh, and Adam and, and Mr. Coxum, when we look at applying resources, are, are these the kinds of programs that are effective? They are, um, and we need more of them. I mean, on ramps is a good one, inroads is another one. Um, right. uh, the, there, uh, those are ones in particular related to, to employment. Then, the, then you've got ones such as the D2D program in Detroit that we did to try and grow uh, local businesses where uh, local businesses, uh, uh, there was a preference in procurement and we grew the spend from 500 million to 830 million in just three years. Uh, then you got programs like Chicago United out there where, which gets large um, businesses out of Chicago to commit to a certain amount of of economic uh, commitment to, to mentoring and growing other businesses. So there is a lot of programs out there and it really is gonna take all of them and then some more to get to where we need to be. The best solutions though, are going to have a high level of private sector involvement and a, 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 and a focus on what the market demands in order for, this. so they're gonna be profit motivated, productivity right. motivated with an inclusion lens. They're not going to be social social service programs that say, how do we help these poor black and brown people but that doesn't really have a bottom line because it won't be sustainable if, uh, if, if programs are social service oriented. All right, right, which, which kind of brings us back to part of the discussion that I had in my slides anyways at the on the onset of the webinar, where we saw some statistics as it related to the availability of, of um, financing through traditional means um, where, where more populations of color do not have as much success in securing uh, loans, uh, first-time loans for entrepreneurs. So how can we grow minority entrepreneurship through expanding access to capital and business expertise? I mean, how do we do that? I mean, it, it sounds like a great idea, uh, uh, you know, as, a, as an idea here on a piece of paper, but how do we make that happen in the real world? Well, I'd love to hear uh, Henry answer, because he's seen this on the ground in entrepreneurship in New Orleans. I'll just offer that, uh, if, if we're following the theme of, of what Rod said a moment ago, of businesses need to lean in to make it sustainable, uh, there is a significant amount of purchasing happening by 
but by large companies that can be more intentionally directed to do business uh, with minority-owned businesses or women-owned or veteran-owned businesses, um, but to make sure that there's intentionality about that purchasing. We've been playing a role in a recent procurement initiative we launched about a year ago to try to help our largest businesses identify uh, businesses that they can do business with to, to localize their purchasing into disadvantaged businesses here in the community with an expectation that will uplift more companies to, to boost their revenues and to be able to compete. Um, but, but maybe others can, can lean in on that as well. I truly believe that that's a role for our EDOs locally across the board. I think it's also important that we tap the Urban League and other self-help organizations to build that perspective on having the ability to be an entrepreneur. It's critical that we begin to have not only a great business plan, but cultivate a relationship with a commercial banker. I, I would I would add, you know, th this is a this is a big it's a big big chop, but it's 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 very important. I mean, uh, one of the things I think is very important is that there's there's an intentionality, and so communities have to set, be intentional about saying that they want to be inclusive, and that leadership has to come from somewhere, whether it's the economic development organization, whether it's the mayor, whether it's a strong business leadership. But communities have to have that conversation about what being inclusive means to them. And mm -hmm. there has to be some relationship cultivation that has to happen. Historically, you know, it, it, it's one of those things now, all of these large companies are coming out with these statements about, you know, Black Lives Matter, or these other things. But, the, but when you look at their leadership, whether it's the procurement, whether it's their staff, whether it's their boards, there's a real question whether whether there's really the, 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 the muscle behind it. So uh, cultivating relationships with communities of color so that there can be some greater trust and then being very intentional about solving a specific problem, a real estate issue, uh, access to capital issue, and doing some ecosystem mapping, uh, and, and really designing and executing to, to be results oriented. I, I think that's at the core of it. And, and, and the last thing I'll say about this is, you know, the, the, the case study of Henry Cokeson is a very interesting one. And what he said is that McDonald's was the biggest security net that one could have. And I think more corporations need to look at that model and figure out how can we make more money by investing in our community and helping other people to build wealth. And, and, and not enough companies have that model, but I think that's that's really where the answer lies. Okay, we have a question here from, from one of our folks who were watching the webinar. What are examples of loan grant programs that have, been, that have lower barriers to entry or below market rate loans? How are these funded? And how do you get support for them? I mean, I know, um, panel, that there's different kinds of programs, such as the State Small Business Credit Initiative, uh, the New Market Tax Credit Program, the Small Business Administration also facilitates loans to small businesses. Are, are there any other ideas that we can put out there? Well, one of the things I would say is probably the best, the best solutions tend to be local because, because the issues that each community faces are different. Um, um, and I think communities are doing some amazing things with community development block grants. So um, as you, with your local communities, if there are ways that you can work with your municipal leadership to figure out if there is a way to create carve outs and special programs around uh, community development block grants, I think that's important. I think uh, building relationships with CDFIs, groups like uh, the Reinvestment Fund and, and LISC and, and other big ones or groups like Nucor down in New Orleans, uh, uh, there are a, a variety of CDFIs that also offer very, very competitive programs. But most of the programs that are going to do this are not going to be national in scale. They're going to be local and maybe state level. Here's another question from one of our um, um, our folks who, who are watching the webinar. One thing I've noticed in our market is that many minority-owned businesses lag behind in terms of having financial statements and other documentation ready for sharing with lenders or others seeking to help them. Uh, Adam and Rod, have you seen this as well? Seems we need to educate small business owners on basic accounting. Um, and this is true. In a lot of the research that I've done, uh, black business owners don't have the same kind of ties and relationships with, with the banks that most, of, most other business owners have. Um, so what are your thoughts, gentlemen? Go ahead, Adam. Well, we've seen that to be the truth uh, or, or the case. Uh, there are programs that exist in nearly every community uh, at least in, in every state for sure, that give access to businesses to be able to have resources. So to the extent that economic developers are 
as Rod said, being intentional about trying to make sure that resources are given is to make sure that there's a playbook available to hand to a business owner rather than say, you know, throw up your hands and say you can't do anything, but to, to walk them through the steps that are out there to be able to help them get uh, their financial house in order as a business. Uh, and many, in many cases, it takes the businesses, I uh, should say the banks, uh, as you heard Henry say, the importance of the banker earlier, uh, the banks also being willing to be uh, patient to walk a borrower through the things that they can do to improve their, their financial position to be able to finance their business rather than a, a quick no, but a, a no with guidance and suggestions about ways to get access to the resources that are out there in, in the community, or at least a direction to the economic development organization that can, that can coach them through these things or the business accelerator that can do so. One more question. I think most of your universities have opportunities, whether it's Southern or U University of New Orleans, uh, Dillard or Xavier, to actually become more learned about whatever entrepreneurial opportunity you want to pursue. We have that through the Urban League, we have that through Goldman Sachs, we have it through J.P. Morgan Chase. We have to avail ourselves of those opportunities. If you have an idea or a dream, you need to invest some time. It is critical that we begin to have the knowledge that understanding that that profit and loss statement is a part of my business plan and that I need a CPA to assist me once I get my business up and running. It is critical oftentimes for me to provide insights to someone and say, who's, do who's doing your financials? Who's reviewing your ratios? Because without that, no one wants to bank you. And I, I'd only add, you know, he mentioned a couple of programs, J.P. Morgan Chase, Goldman Sachs and others. Every bank is required for, through Community Reinvestment Act to make reinvestments in their communities. And I would say, you know, if you don't know what the reinvestment plan is for your local banks, um, that that's a great uh, conversation to have with your banking leadership about how are they reinvesting the, the, the dollars that are required to reinvest in low and moderate income communities uh, per, fed, per fed regulations. Okay, I think we'll do one more question and then uh, we'll invite Chanel to come back on to, to wrap things up as I think we've gone a bit over time. So, um, one more question from the audience. The scale of the disparity between races is remarkable, as we all know. We need a long-term solution to a long-term problem. Where does a community start an initiative that goes beyond the creation of a diversity committee? So I, I will I will kick that off. I think the first thing is to have that is is to have the conversation. There has to be a conversation and there has to be recognition of a history of pain and a history of non-engagement in many cases on this issue. I think it's hard to just say, how do we all move forward when there is an established trust? Um, so I think that relationship cultivation is important in those tough conversations. The second piece is to really figure out what it is that you want to be as a community. Um, what kind of community do you want to be and what challenge is it that you're going to tackle, To initial challenge that you're going to tackle to move in that direction. And then I think the third piece is figuring out who the players are that can actually help push the ball and making some sort of hard commitment to, to moving that needle forward. That can be program, that can be policy, that can be practice, um, but I think those things have to be codified and there has to be a continual touch base uh, to, to figure out whether or not that progress is actually being made. And that conversation isn't something that happens in a vacuum without black and brown communities. It happens at the business level at the, and at the policy level, but it also happens with these uh, businesses and communities that are affected. I'll add, uh, unless Henry, you wanted to jump in. No, please, Adam. Well, one, and the comment ended by asking about, you know, other than creating a diversity committee, and I think the diversity committee role, at least in our experience, was to give space for the conversation for our board of directors and our investors who support our organization as a business funded organization to begin to talk about it and understand it uh, especially for the white community in Baton Rouge, it was important for us to be able to see that they were deeply involved in the conversation uh, rather than, uh, than our black business community saying that it was the priority of just of the black community. It needed to be the, the whole community's priority. And that came by fostering and giving space to that conversation. I think that's an important piece to this. The second thing that I would offer is to look at every program that you're leading, uh, whether you're an economic development organization, a chamber, a state economic development agency, 
uh, and to look at it through a lens of economic inclusion. Uh, every one of the things that an organization is doing, uh, the question should be asked, how can I view this through the lens of making sure that it, uh, by doing this work, has an economic inclusion uh, angle to it or a space for that work to exist within it, uh, whether that has to do with entrepreneurship work, site certification work, business retention and expansion, uh, or even business attraction, if, if that's part of the organization's work, talent attraction and workforce development, all of these have uh, an aspect of them that should be deeply focused on, on economic inclusion issues to understand the disparities in each of our communities or each, each of our states uh, and to try to drive those program changes and then where necessary to introduce new programs and initiatives uh, to address those gaps. We, we, we are ourselves at the very beginning, I think, of a very long path of doing this work. Um, but we also know that our organization is deeply committed uh, to every member of our board to, to make sure that we're leaning in on this work and doing so for a very long period of time in every aspect of our work. And it doesn't change the quality or the focus of our economic development organization to also be very intentional about the disparities in our community, which as we started out saying has a lot to do with economic development uh, and job creation. The data bears out that we'll see higher rates of employment growth as we do so. Right. I think it's also important for the, those of us who serve on boards to also chase the question. Make sure that what we're doing adds value to the community and that it is engaging. Great. Um, we have a, just a, a quick comment uh, from Terry Dennison as it related to um, financial statements. Uh, and uh, Terry says that small business development centers and SCORE women business centers can help entrepreneurs with having the records information needed to access capital. So thanks very much for that, Terry. Okay, so let's move to, to close out the, uh, the webinar. Um, you know, I, I took a few notes based on some of the research that I was doing in the lead up to the webinar, and I, I thought it would be good to finish off with some evidence-based strategies that have been effective um, relating specifically to employment and entrepreneurship. So some of the strategies that we may want to consider are to invest early, maximize lifelong health and educational achievement, empower social mobility, increase economic growth by supporting inclusionary zoning policies, improve existing communities through neighborhood revitalization, better connect youth to job skills through career-focused education, create economic opportunity through business development in underserved areas, grow minority entrepreneurship through expanding access to capital, as we've noticed is, has been a uh, Sort of a key theme running through a lot of our discussions. So um, with that being said, uh, I'd like to thank everybody for participating in today's webinar. I'd like to thank our panelists so much for their time, not just today, but in the lead up to the webinar and the preparation and the research and putting their slides together. These are our three very busy men. So uh, from the bottom of my heart, thank you so much for participating in what I think is a, a very important webinar. And um, again, thanks to IEDC. And at this time, uh, Chanel, I, I invite you to, to come back out and, and close us out. Yes, thanks, Steve. So on that note, we'd like to thank everyone for tuning in this afternoon. As a reminder, all presentations will be posted on IEDC's website underneath the Take Action Against Racism Economic Development page within 48 hours. To reiterate, Steve, we'd like to thank all of our speakers this afternoon. So thank you, Steve, Rod Miller, Henry Colcom, and Adam Knapp. This information proves to be very helpful for our economic developers who are working to foster equity within their organizations. And as part of the Take Action Against Racism Economic Devel Development Series, our next webinar is titled Race and Economic Development, Beginning America's Next Story, an interview with Angela Glover Blackwell of PolicyLink. And this will be on Monday, August 24th. And I'll just give a brief description of the actual webinar. So please join Tracy McDaniel, President of TIC Strategies and past chair of the International Economic Development Council and Angela Glover Blackwell, founder of PolicyLink and a candid conversation about the state of our economy and the pandemic's devastating impact on communities of color. Tracy and Angela will also explore what can be learned from the nationwide Black Lives Matter protests and how we can build more equitable local economies. 
So please reach out to IDC with any questions. Be well, stay safe, and have a great afternoon. Thanks so much. Thanks, Janelle. Thanks, everybody. Stay safe. Thanks.